Let's all go to the lobby. Let's all go to the lobby. Let's all go to the lobby to get ourselves a treat. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the Double Feature Podcast, where every week, me and David bring two movies together and try and kill a weekend, try and find the perfect marathon, try and find the best double feature. David, how are you doing? Oh, Dean, you know, I've just really enjoyed this uh, educational week. Um, We've dug into some deeply interesting and fascinating and and truthful, I might find, uh, documentaries that really shed some light on some interesting subjects that i honestly knew little about i you know um these are the the tiger king of a previous generation like the the real hard-hitting kind of documentaries we really need yeah you could say so i mean who 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 would have thought that new zealand was full of vampires and that just riddled with them we never knew about so many hard rock bands in the in the 80s that were just experimenting with uh improv jazz you know and and stonehenge true it's it's some it's some crazy stuff here here at the double feature but yeah okay so let's just for anybody who doesn't know what we're we're watching this week uh we're gonna be continuing on finishing our comedy month which has been a long interesting journey because we've seen some really good ones we've seen some really weird ones and now we're in the really meta ones Mm. we'll be talking about this is spinal tap and what we do in the shadows the kind of the forerunner of the mockumentary genre with this is spinal tap i'm not sure if it's the first one i know it's the most famous one and then what we do in the shadow which is the most modern one that because that one was the one that spawned the whole tv series on fx and it kind of launched um the director I'm going to try not to fuck up his name. Uh, Taki Waititi? I, is that how you pronounce his name? No, Am I way, way the fuck off? Come on, dude. Uh, he's, he's an Oscar winning okay, director you, now. I mean, that was right, a director, you, I think. But um, I think he's uh, he won a bunch of shit. But okay, how do you pronounce his name? Taika Waititi. Taiki Waititi. That is, not the, how it, that is not how it is spelled. All right? I'm going to point that out. It's I'm a dumb cool. American. I, I don't know. I, I think I'm going to have to contest this one. All right, but that's exactly um, how it's spelled. It's not even fucking close. I'm a dumb American. It is. It is spelled Taki, or not Takis. <laughs> Taiki. Ta- Taika. Waititi. It's okay. It's it's a bit. Right. Dean. It's a bit. It is a bit. So yeah, um, but with what we do in the shadows, this is the film that kind of launched his career, and it is also a mockumentary. And we thought these two would be very interesting to look at, and see the evolution of the mockumentary genre. From, you know, basically its inception in the 1980s to kind of what it turned in now into the, like, the 2000s, 2010s, and what we're in now. But yeah, that's the thesis of the episode, I guess. Yes. Um, I don't know. I mean, I particularly love this mode of film when it's done correctly. It can be terrible when done poorly. Um, yes. I, I've, I think I've seen more bad mockumentaries than good ones. Yeah, well, I don't know if I've seen more bad than good because there, there's th- this is obviously a popular on television mostly for shows like The Office, uh, Parks and Rec. One of my favorites is Trailer Park Boys. Oh, Reno Nine One One. Oh, Reno Nine One One is absolutely fantastic. Mm. Um, but yeah, I mean, if I was to think of a bad one off the top of my head, I probably couldn't come up with it because I've wanted to purge it from my mind. That's how bad it can go when it isn't done correctly. Well, a lot of them are, I guess, where it comes down to, I think I've seen a lot of bad found footage films, which feels like this is what this kind of spawned out of, is that found footage genre of, like, the really early 80s and 70s and then kind of disappeared. And, like, you know, like Paranormal Activity, those are found footage movies, and those you can almost classify as, you know, false documentary films. Yeah. So like Blair Witch Project, you can classify as a false documentary film. It uses the gimmick it, of documentary, definitely. Yeah. But yeah, I've seen a lot of bad ones. Yeah. But these two, I think, are... One of them, I think, is very good. 
That's the, See, that's the thing I'm using to poke. This. You keep teasing me with this, and that for, sooner or later we're going to find out here, and it's going to cause... Either I'm going to completely understand you, though disagree, or we're going to have a lot of problems. That That is why people show up to the double feature for, for the hot takes here. It could be too hot of a take. An interesting little tidbit before we really... Uh, dig into things here is that apparently mockumentary did originate all the way back into the 1950s when apparently really? when apparently it was slightly there was a fad you could say of using archival film footage to come up with these kinds of comedic um, I guess newsreel situations or uh, this one let me see here a very early example was a short piece on the Swiss Spaghetti Harvest that appeared in an April Fool's prank on the British television program Panorama in 1957. So you could say this actually originated on TV. Well, that's kind of interesting because I, I think that's like the, that might just be like the modern perception is that mockumentary starts with This is Spinal Tap because it's like the most famous one. Yeah, that's true. It does list right below, below that um, even though the term originated in the 1960s, was popularized by Rob Reiner's hit film. Mm. Yeah, and also this is another Rob Reiner film, which is is this part of is this where the streak started for Rob Reiner? Ah, uh, so that he, that that reveals it right there. It's, what? it's spoiled that this is where the streak starts, so now we know which one Dean doesn't like. Oh no, that didn't that didn't ask. I'm wondering, was it this piece of shit or was it the one that came after it? Oh yeah, uh, like, okay, I'm gonna twist. throw out the football. Um, yeah, plot twist. Yeah, uh, my thoughts on this is Final Tap will be elaborated on, but I will say that I may not be a huge fan of of the of the band Spinal Tap. I might be the guy saying Shark Sandwich. This is a shit sandwich for their album. Come on, you can't oh, tell man. me you didn't laugh at that though. I mean, there are some parts in it that I laughed at. Don't oh, get me man. wrong, but like overall, I it might be that. I just didn't didn't groove with it. I don't know. Like, so you're we're, telling me we're that get you it. are defying the the movie god Rob Reiner? I, bro, don't say that. He'll find me. Exactly. Right? I was like, gonna say. Rob, you know, I was gonna be nice Rob to you and be and like, his big you know, khaki sweaters are gonna get me. I was gonna be nice this week too and be like, wow, I didn't know Rob Reiner, Rob Reiner and Dean looked uh, so much alike. But now I see that Dean has none of the characteristics of a successful movie genius like rob reiner wow wow what a savage oh you need to you need to wear more naval hats more naval hats and tacky like striped cosby sweaters that is the yeah. that's the rob reiner aesthetic what is up with the naval hat by the way what what I is that i don't know i have no idea but every like like still i see of that guy in like production stuff he's wearing the fucking hat and i don't know why yeah or even like i've seen military hats with other directors too because the ball cap is a pretty common fashion statement for a director but the military or navy or like air force cap for some reason is just also something that is in the wardrobe of most of these famous directors and i don't know why I wonder if it's like part of that secret like blood cult you have to join when you go into Hollywood. That, right? that would make a lot of sense as to why Francis Ford Coppola has the career he does. <laughs> <laughs> wow, he he refused to join the blood cult or what? <laughs> yeah, the curse of the blood cult for years, and then you know finally everything came together after Godfather when he joined. Yeah. There it is. That that's got to be it. That's got to be it. Yeah. Well, oh, yeah. enough about the blood cult before they come and find us. Um, why don't we dig into these two hunkin hunkin movies, uh, both in a quick and easy hour and a half. Yeah, like I very much appreciated that this week that these were tight nineties. These felt like lo almost like watching a long YouTube video at times, and I really enjoyed it. <laughs> That's such a yeah, modern I way of looking at it, but. I think well, that's kind of an accurate look at it, right? I because it's a thing where, um, television is basically what these movies are, right? For the most part, like most modern like American sitcoms, like we stated, you know. Well, I guess not modern because they're. I don't think the shows are running anymore. You know, Office, Parks and Rec. You know, Reno 911, things like that. Like a lot of televisions of our kind of generation were done in this format so these are probably like these are super breezy watches 
for like modern audiences. Yeah, pretty much. Um, and I, I do think that there is something to be said about the age gap between these movies. I also think that will contribute to probably part of the reason you didn't like one of them over the other. Because one of them is leans much more into like the the mode of making fun of its subject, whereas another one almost like is also trying to comment on it while making fun of it. And it works for some people, works doesn't work for other people. Um, I can certainly see that. Because I think part of the thing that got gets me for Spinal Tap is being a musician or having been a part of probably not on that scale, the music industry at some point, I get a lot of the jokes or at least the jokes re- probably resonate more with me is how I would put it. Well, well, I can understand that. Um, I mean, I, I wasn't a musician to like your, your caliber. Like I, my musicianship never left the school. If I'll put it, I'll put it like that. Right. Yeah. But, um, no, I, I got the joke. I understood the things that were going on. You know, the music industry is ridiculous even when it's taken seriously, it's it's a ridiculous business. But some of the jokes I was like, there's kind of a long gap in between in between the jokes here. This is starting to feel like just a behind the music thing, and then we get to a gag, and then a big stretch of like I'm waiting for the gag to show up. Where's the behind the music? And then the drummer explodes, and I'm like, okay, there's the gag. But yeah, like I had things with this was Final Tap that all. I'll get into. Yeah. I think what we do in the shadows works, you know, differently. And it's also a thing. I'm a fan of the show, which yeah. is a thing. And Taika, like Taika Waititi and, and um, well, I'm forgetting his name off the top of my head, but famously of uh, Flight Jemaine of the Conchords. Yeah. Um, you know, just another show I really like. Yeah, exactly. And uh, ironically about the music industry. Uh, but yeah, like those guys are two comedic geniuses. I mean, uh, that's I think that's another reason maybe Spinal Tap doesn't hit quite as hard is you don't really like these aren't recognizable actors in Spinal Tap so maybe that there isn't like a first um, like icebreaker like if you were watching something with Will Ferrell in it you know mm-hmm. it's like when the, when you see a star that you know is going to be funny maybe there's a little bit more expectation to laugh at the end of things which is kind of an interesting thought um, to start off this episode but. Uh, not one I intended to find, that's for sure. You want to just clean up this introduction, get in the log lines, and we just start going? Yeah. Because I think we're about to just jump straight into Spinal Tap. Pretty much. Let's roll right with it. All right. Quick elevator pitches, and let's jump into Spinal Tap. This week, we have What We Do in the Shadows. A documentary crew follows a group of nocturnal flatmates and the complications of inviting a new member into their group that sucks all the fun out of things. This is the spin- puns are, are <laughs> so palatable uh, in that log line. Just oh you God. wait. This is Spinal Tap, a British metal band towards the harsh industry landscape of the U.S. in search of the audience that will fall in love with their hard rock. Oh, <laughs> oh, uh, yeah. The puns the, and that's my. That, this might be the last episode. Ooh, ooh, those are rough. Those are rough. I can see why people don't want to listen to us. Come boy, on, boy, man. gonna end up gonna end comedy month in a in a banger. Right in a way. bang. I gotcha. I gotcha. But yeah, so let's get started. I think we kind of agreed we wanted to start with Spinal Tap. Yeah. Why don't we so, get right into it? This is Spinal Tap. Right. Spinal Tap. Okay. <laughs> so, yeah, I, I know we've had a, some difficulty talking about um, comedies on this show before. A lot of it's because most comedies are kind of loose with, like, narrative mm. a lot of the times. And this is one of those kinds of films where things just happen. It is the story of this band who's just on this tour of the U.S., where their band kind of falls apart and they just it feels like they just hit every stereotype of shit 80s bands had to deal with and a lot of it is like the drummer always always leaves right the drummer is always the guy that just gets rotated out of the band and no one notices 
David, you can speak on this. You were a drummer. How many times did were you the seventh drummer for your band? There's never a drummer in a band, but it is actually a very correct stereotype. I've cycled through plenty of drummer uh, for personal, professional, and other reasons. Uh, never had one die on me as often, especially as this fan, and especially because that's one of my favorite running gags in this movie. Is just the that every ways. show is a different drummer. Well, they have the same drummer on this tour, I think, the whole time up until the end when he eventually dies. Because that is the circle of life, and this is Spinal Tap. Uh, the wheel in the sky keeps on turning, and so does the drummer in his grave. <laughs> but, oh. yeah, I mean, I think that certainly the there's kind of a disconnect between... There's some good jokes and gags in the movie. The, the, um, like the best friend storyline that they have is a good one. Though I think it gets a little bit too weighted on one side where it actually ends up being mostly in the end rather than the beginning Mm -hmm. and other than that yeah maybe maybe like i like the i love the live performances now Uh, like upon multiple watchings the more i notice things but i do kind of see how that gag of them basically being like a a raunchy like sexy 80s metal band that is too wrapped up in their packages is a joke that's kind of overdone in the movie. A little. Well, I don't even think Van Halen it's... cared about their own dicks that much. Whoa, <laughs> whoa. Okay, first of all, Van Halen cared a lot about their dicks. There are more than a few songs about their dicks. Thank you. Yeah. But like, I think that's kind of that's kind of an, a point you bring up, right? Even Van Halen didn't care this much. But the Spinal Tap, they're obviously a parody of like 80s hair hair bands right yeah or like big big you know rock bands would you say van halen is the is the band they're parodying the most of i think it's a mixture of things because they kind of do a couple different types of these metal bands um like yeah they do a lot of like the sex craze metal like hair metal but then they do some of like that um warlock rock you know they where they mix in some of like the crazy synthesizers and the the dark fucking ballads that maybe is <laughs> when, something when reminiscent they... of a foreigner or a uh... I almost can equate that to like Led Zeppelin when they would start singing about Frodo and the Hobbits of Mordor. True. But... Also, for anybody who doesn't know, listen to um, Zeppelin album four. Like half of those songs are about Lord of the Rings. There, no meme. There's a maybe I'm trying to think of who it is, but there's a famous a 80s metal band. That has just like a one hit, but their first album sounds exactly like what this is. And let me see if I can narrow it down to which it is. Because it's it's either Thin Lizzy or Def Leppard. I just can never remember which one it is. Wait, wait, Def Def Leppard with, you know, Pour Some Sugar On Me, that that one? Or Thin Lizzy with The Boys Are Back In Town? Because these guys sound more like, uh, I want to say Def Leppard than Thin Lizzy? True, but like there's a there's specifically nah, probably not gonna be able to find it because I listened to this album a while ago. But yeah, it's like there was like a weird stretch of time when in like the late seventies and kind of into the early eighties, there were some hard rock or metal bands that were like really deep into making rock operas because the Who had so much success on it that they were like, let's do this, and then it ended up being terrible. <laughs> but, oh. Yeah, okay. Also, I've seen Tommy. That movie is weird as hell. Yeah. It's a weird I don't album. know if it's yeah. I don't know if Tommy's a masterpiece or a bad movie, but it it's something, damn it. Album's a masterpiece. The jury may be out on the, on the movie until we can get a discussion going on this channel, but you know, yeah. maybe that could be an interesting month for next year is M- movies Music March. Y- yeah, honestly, like music movies one week even being the movie about the album or something like that that'd be oh, that'd be pretty interesting dude okay it's it's like the movie about the album it's um oh what's that fucking it's some kind of monster that's the metallica documentary oh yeah 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 uh i've seen that one though and it's not necessarily like tommy in that tommy is actually like the story of the album as it's told yeah. that one it's like it's how the album got made, right? It's a straight documentary. No, it's like it's mixed with like a live performance that's staged 
as well as like this weird story that like accompanies the music but it's like oh, more no, like a you're mu- think i know what i know which one you're thinking about i think you're talking about into the never i'm talking oh, about some yeah, kind of monster yeah. when they were doing saint anger like that album oh yeah maybe where where they were like yo are we gonna break up because we all fucking hate each other or are we gonna keep making millions of dollars and they ended up that, keeping that, making millions of dollars keep making millions of dollars yeah uh there's, no there's i will a reason admit, why that album sucks that la- the last metallica album that came out a couple of years ago or like a year ago or something was actually not bad hmm. so i check it out anybody who's uh but, but you know okay aside from all this they do that. They have these weird, like... Because this is one thing that's always working about the movie. Is that they, they allude to the fact that the band's been together since, like, the 1960s. Yeah, they're like a... a ro- they they kind of mirror the Rolling Stones in that way. Yeah. Like, they even look like the Rolling Stones and the Beatles, like, in their early early careers. Or like, the mop tops and the suits and stuff. And they're playing on, like, Ed Sullivan show. Yeah, and then they get, like, this psychedelic phase... The thing I never liked about that is that while it's true probably to British rock, I don't think there's one British rock brand from that era that ended up becoming a hair metal band. So it's like totally like weird kind of I, like the story. I think of that. that's oh, well, I think that's almost part of the joke of the movie, right? Where these guys are supposed to be this um, band that's basically survived, but they're but they're like super washed up right because when we meet them in the movie they're like like everybody is either absolutely hates their albums or like thinks they're totally terrible musicians or all this other stuff and they're just kind of indifferent to it all kind of it's kind of weird right it's almost like it they look like the kind of band you would see on a vh1 special right that's certainly true very very heavy um Oh, what's his face? The lead singer of it's not Skid Row. Um, Are you thinking about like Quiet Riot or no? It's a uh, Tommy something. Tommy Lee Jones, but that's not it. That's an actor's name. That's an act. Yeah. Uh, oh, oh, you think about the guy from Montley Crew? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I fucking it reminds me. Well, I like... think his name is just Tommy Lee. Maybe. Think. I mean, let me look it up. But yeah, so like, I think what would have been more interesting to me, and I think this will become what I think overall about this movie throughout the episode, because I do think it's open to criticism, um, is I think that maybe Reiner, this being like really the first mockumentary movie, we could probably go as far as to say that, uh, mm. Maybe just wasn't quite like not quite understanding exactly what would go into taking reality and putting it on screen to make it as seem as real as possible. I almost feel like he could have gone with them being like a a a dive bar band at first, and then that would have been a funny thing to see is like how they maybe were like really good at selling drinks for bar owners as like a sex craze metal band, and then they turn into then you get to see when they get a little uh notoriety and then they start playing at the clubs and that's when like the wife you could then see that that's when the wife comes into the picture because she's a groupie or something and maybe that would have then set up the best friend thing along the way you know to give the the whole thing a little bit more weight and rather than just kind of like passively making fun of these eras of music for one or two jokes yeah like that i think that's my kind of that's my issue with the movie when i think we boil it down is It feels like the story at hand of the movie is so inconsequential, right? Like what, what's the conflict of the movie? Is it, is it the fact that like the lead singer and the lead guitarist, like they have a falling out of their friendship that only happens in the last like half hour of the movie, right? Pretty much. And it's not even because of the business too, which is, and I, maybe that's like the part, the problem with it. There, I think there's too many moving parts at the end of the day where the love story is not necessarily the problem, but it is the problem to one of them. But also the business is the problem because the love story is making the business the problem. But then like the resolution to it is that the business is the problem, even though it was apparently the love story making everything a problem. You know, it's like there's kind of maybe not everything cohedes quite so well. It's one of those things where it's like, I might not really like, 
look, I'm I'm not gonna lie. I'm probably not gonna rewatch this movie very soon. Yeah. But I'm not gonna say it's a bad movie. It's not a bad movie. It's still a good movie. I think you know that you've often said this about some movies before. I think this is the type of movie you watch with your bros with some beers to just make fun of it. Yeah. This this is a this is a a beer and bros kind of movie. And then maybe you play it play a little fucking Guitar Hero with the whole band set up and everything afterward to just fucking make fun of it further when you're smashed. Uh, you know, I, yeah, I think this may be more of a good time movie than it is anything else. Um, though I, I, I will go off on a limb to say that I think you're, I think you're wrong about it not being funny, but you know, I guess it's all up to personal taste. The comedy uh, is subjective. I, yeah. Like, I, again, I think that's the thing, you know, some people find th- certain things funny. Some people don't. I mean, there are bits in this movie that I think are funny. Again, the Stonehenge bit gets me every time. Yeah. I don't know why, <laughs> but it just makes me laugh. Because, th- you know, and maybe that speaks to how some of the better jokes in the movie land is that such a simple, like the setup for it slides right past you. You don't even mm. notice. Even though you the camera blatantly on the napkin, you could see him right in inches. And then you're just like, wait a minute upon like further re- i don't even think i picked up on it this time but yeah you're right it's just like I, it's not even like it coming down from the stage which is like the ultimate second punchline to that it's the manager having to deal with it down. in the in the hotel room oh it's so good or yeah. and then they get the dancers to come out and it's like the little people and they're just dancing <laughs> around yeah. the stonehenge set and i'm like this oh god this is so t- <laughs> and it's great yeah or or they have they come out in the pods and the guy get and the bass player gets stuck in the pod and he can't get out so he has to like just crampedly play the bass in there while the gr- roadies try and break him out yeah and i'm like i feel that's a thing that actually happens to people right like okay that's the thing about this movie that i think is great where i can watch this and i'm like you know, that seems absolutely ridiculous, but there's no way that's not based on something that actually happened to a rock band. Oh, I'm sure. Like, that's one of the nice things about this movie is all, like, kind of things that seem anecdotal. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and, you know, I, I, w- I almost feel like maybe that's what this documentary could have used more of is a lot. I feel like there was definitely a missing cameo somewhere in this movie, that this movie should have had some type of cameo somewhere in there from a from a rock band at the time but i'm sure it's like so many people were taking themselves so seriously you know that they probably didn't want to participate um for ironically the same reasons that the movie was being made probably i mean if you want a good endorsement of this film so the man the myth the legend ozzy osbourne when he first saw this movie because i guess rob reiner did like a premiere thing for a bunch of like rock people being like hey guys you know this is a movie i made about you guys blah 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 and ozzy osbourne didn't realize it was a comedy he thought it was a straight documentary and he, rob reiner's like wait what and ozzy is like bro like this shit is is fucking too real man like it's like it's like you followed me around and rob reiner's like bro you know i made half of this shit up right and hmm. ozzy's like no no you're just fucking with me and then Ozzy Osbourne proceeded to go and like bite the heads off a bat and do a bunch of cocaine, but yeah, but that that was apparently like a consensus thing amongst a bunch of musicians at the time, where they thought this like the first time they saw this they thought it was a a real thing, they thought it was a straight documentary they didn't think it was a comedy. I mean, uh, there are a lot of things that this movie gets totally right in that even down to the fact like in the end when they find salvation by becoming huge in Japan. Like, that happened for a lot of bands, or even bands that were still famous in all other parts of the world. Even my band found popularity in Japan after I left it, so... <laughs> That's so fucking true, dude. Yeah. Like, I, I've seen so many bands that were, like, one-hit wonders in America or Europe or whatever, and for some reason, they are huge in Japan. Like, insanely huge in Japan, and no one knows why. It's just that blue jeans effect, man. I mean, for some reason, the 1980s, 70s, 80s, 90s were just perfect time for American culture to permeate other countries. 
I don't know. It's it's the secret of it's the secret of blue jeans, man. Yeah. Who knows? I mean, I guess okay. I guess before we wrap up the and close the curtains and you know sing our ballads for this uh, documentary, um, what what would you say your favorite bit in the movie is? Um, I think I already said it. It it's probably the Stonehenge scene because I like like sight gags and things where it's something you don't need a lot of dialogue to find funny yeah and that was a good one the other one that i laughed at out loud was when they were going through uh when the bassist was going through the metal detector at the airport (laughs) and the wand's going and he's just got this unit on hanging off of his leg and they wave the baton and then he just pulls out the foil wrapped salami and every everybody laughs it's i don't know why dick jokes are funny no matter who you are i think it's just another one of those like sight gags where they don't need a lot of dialogue to get through it mm. and uh and maybe too because that's one thing i think is terribly under under serviced in this and maybe it was just not quite a thing at the time but like tour pranks and tour shenanigans were much more parts of what made that lifestyle so fun and funny um like one of my favorite ones we did while we were on tour is when it because we, we were in a minivan you know we never really we never really got the limo and plane lifestyle but uh whenever we would roll into a new town so for some reason our one of our one of my uh bandmates ryan first thing he would do roll down the window and find somebody on like a street corner and be like hey can you point me to the direction of, and then the van would drive off and the person would just be left waiting. Like what, where do you, what directions did you need to ride? Would just fucking break out laughing at the, it was just such a stupid joke, but that was, that was one of my favorite parts about it is all the stuff you would do peripherally aside from the reason you actually took the trip. I mean, there's another, there's another band movie that I feel you probably relate to far more than this is spinal tap and it is have you ever seen the movie green room no i haven't and i wanted to very badly because i've never quite run into a horror show <laughs> like that one apparently <laughs> is and i've never quite run into white supremacists thankfully but uh yeah i'm just I saying mean, the opening sequence of these guys in the van that's out of gas because obviously it's out of gas and they have to ride a bike somewhere to get gas for their van like it just it looks like something that you would have probably related to from the stories you have told me of the road man thankfully i've never we've never ran out of gas i mean we're, it get probably kind of gets to a point where now with like smartphones and shit you're smart enough as to not let anything like that happen i've had problems where like hotel reservations got fucked up like there was one where we were going to stay in San Francisco and we booked the hotel when we were leaving Los Angeles and it was like a nine hour drive to get up there. And we get up there late into the night and the guy's like, bro, you missed check-in time by like hours. And then he was, and then we were, he was like, but I'll let you in. I was, uh, it's fine. We could do something about it. Cause it's a 21 and up room, but yeah, I get it. You probably don't have much place else to go. And my, or no, what it was is that he wasn't quite ready to tell us that. My bandmate Ryan, again, <laughs> uh, was like, Your man, that's, Ryan. he was like mouthing off to him and like, man, that's fucked up. And then the guy was like, I was going to let you have the room, but now I'm not going to, which in hindsight, he probably wasn't. But uh, yeah, and then we had to like figure out where to, either we were going to stay in a Walmart parking lot for the night or... I was going to take out some cash and get us a room. And thankfully there was like an ATM and a motel six right there. And I was like, fuck, it would have been brutal to stay in a Walmart in the middle of fucking San Francisco. But yeah, I think that's, that's how people get killed. Probably not in San Francisco. If anything, we'd just be like preached to by environmental activists, but you know, True. but yeah, but that is spinal tap. Crazy. And, uh, you being the musician, this was your movie. But now we'll get into what we do in the shadows. And me being a vampire from New Zealand, will I'll be able to provide more commentary on that film. Very true. Bleh, bleh. But we'll do that 
right after this. Dean, I found a great way for us to do something cool and to make a little money on the side. Oh, great. I've been looking for a new place to put my money. What do you got? No investment needed. In fact, it's super easy, and there's creation tools we can use to record our podcast right from the phone or computer. Wait, why would you record a podcast on your phone? You want? No, never mind, never mind. Where do I put my money for this? Uh, I don't need any of your money. Uh, we can even get our podcast distributed to big streaming platforms like Spotify and Google Podcasts. Oh, I get it now. I get it now. We're talking big business here, okay? So you're going to need a lot of money from me. How much money are we talking here? No, definitely don't need any of your money. In fact, we can make money from the podcast with no minimum listenership. Okay, now I think I'm getting what you're going at here. We need to spend money to make money. So we're, we're talking some big gains here, big gains. No, no, definitely no, I don't need any of your money. Just all we need to make a podcast right in one place. Okay, okay, so what you're telling me is that you're gonna need a pretty big check from me for this podcast, so. Do I just make it out to cash? Because it's no problem for me. I'll just you know write it up right now. No. Listen, Dean, just head over to anchor.fm and check it out. You'll see why Anchor is the best place for us to record, edit, and distribute our podcasts. And I definitely do not need any of your money. Shut up and take my money. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to the second half of this double feature, The B Plot of this film uh, and that is what we do in the shadows which yeah this is uh this is a documentary or is a mockumentary about vampires yeah in new zealand I, which is weird and really cool i was an hour into the movie before i realized it wasn't real honestly uh i'm still not convinced it's not real you never know Mm-mm. you never know i think uh watiti is actually a uh a vampire, and he's just been faking it this whole time. We know your your secrets. But yeah, so what we do in the shadows is a little bit is a little bit different than uh, than this is Final Tap. We can say we can definitely say it's much more on the nose, which mm-hmm. probably helps it more than it hurts it. Honestly, uh, it's a hilarious movie, full of a lot of really good gags, and I think a really you know, it's kind of funny. I, I can't remember exactly what the year is on when this movie came out. Uh, 2014. So that was my senior year of high school. There was a movie that came out in my freshman year of high school. I remember because I was really stoked on getting to go watch this movie. It was like that first time in freshman year of high school when you're like, I'm going with the seniors to go hang out. This is kind of fun. Wow. We went and saw... Uh, vampires suck i don't know if you remember this oh god was that the, was, that was the the scary movie like twilight spoof right yeah oh you poor sweet summer <laughs> child i had a lot of fun because there was again hanging out with the cool kids but man it, it was not a good vampire movie versus this which is a fantastic vampire movie and i, I think a really funny way to make fun of this subject yeah and i think it's interesting that like that's something you bring up is because both of these films are parody films right yeah and what we do in the shadow is a parody of very specifically like vampire stuff and yeah this has some really weirdly poignant things to say about vampire like mythology and culture shit that's just fucking ridiculous if you think about it for more than like 10 minutes or it's like, um, what is it? Oh, why do they drink blood? Because they can't eat human food. Well, what happens if they eat human food and they projectile vomit all the blood? Yeah. It looks like Johnny Depp was sucked into the waterbed. Like, it's like that scene when they eat, like, a French fry. Yeah, and what's even funny about that is, like, it really kind of makes me think, oh, vampires as a whole don't really make sense. Nah. And, of course, of, of course they don't. They're, you know, cre- humans that can turn into bats or undead humans i've never really quite understood the the dead or undead status of a vampire so definitely undead but also extremely boinkable depending on the vampire which is weird 
Is that like a thing when you become a vampire? You you just go from like being like a like a solid six to like at least an eight or a nine. Is that like a thing for vampires? I think that's certainly true, and especially because Taiga Watiti is constantly a ten. That's for sure. <laughs> you, you're a, you're a fan of the man who played Hitler. He's probably the hottest Hitler to ever grace these screens. Jesus <laughs> Christ. <laughs> uh, oh. But yeah, I mean, I, I think the extra funny thing about this is I love that Nosferatu found its way into this movie because that's yes. a deep vampire cut. Oh my God. That is, I, I can't remember that that character's actual name, but, oh, it's Peter. Peter, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. It is such a good, like, gag because he's just this weird fucking, like, creature thing that's also, like, super codependent because he can't, like, he can't just, like, feed on people. He has to turn them into more vampires because he's, like, so fucking lonely in the basement. (laughs) And it's so good. And it's so fun. And they basically treat him like a pet. Well, I think, I think all of the characters have an ability to turn other people into vampires. Um, Yeah. Because that's one of the key plot points in the movie, which, again, we can say that this probably has a better plot than... Um, this is Final Tap? This is Final Tap, yes. And I don't know. I mean, I, I, where would you like to begin with this? Because we could, we could go to that this juicy, juicy plot. We could talk about some of the best gags in the movie. Probably the fact that this movie also does pretty well with horror. Yeah, there's some legitimate attempts at like scares in this right yeah and you know obviously you're not in the mood for scares when you watch this so they don't quite hit but i do still think that they do a good job at uh choreographing everything yeah i think it is interesting when they have the um oh god i think it's nick when they have nick come into the house because they they're gonna feed on him and then he's like oh i'm gonna escape and he tries to run out of the mansion and that just literally turns into a horror film yeah. For like for like five unbroken minutes, that is also met with the like the stoic Australian New Zealand. Uh, I don't really give a shit, mate. Kind of attitude, which really I think that's one of my favorite parts about this is like the that stoicness just kind of like deadpans everything. Yeah, I is this? Would you say this is a deadpan comedy? I don't know. I wouldn't probably not strict deadpan, but. It certainly helps a lot of the parody, that's for sure. Because I think parody has helped when they aren't so silly about it or they aren't like trying. Because the movie's on the nose, but it's not like it's not throwing it in your face on the nose. It's like all the jokes are simple, but at the same time, we're not going to acknowledge them so they're even funnier. Yeah. But you know what? I think I want to talk about the characters before we talk about a lot of the plot because. Oh man, every one of these characters is a parody of some facet of like vampire films, right? Yeah, they like, literally go have, through the centuries. Yeah, because we have like Vladislav played by um Jemaine Clement, who is basically he was just like Vlad the Impaler, right? Like his liter that is literally his gag, is he's just Vlad the Impaler. Yeah. The basis for like Dracula and shit. And then we have Viago, played by um our director. Who is interview with a vampire, right? He's all he's every Anne Rice vampire, and then we have Deacon, uh, played by Johnny Brung, who is basically the the most horny vampire person in the room, right? Yeah, it's like I, I almost feel like um, they tried to take a character because I think both all the characters also have this double sword to them, where Vlad the Impaler is like also the sexy vampire. Uh, um, Viago is like the the Edgar Allan Poe I'm depressed vampire and then Deacon is the how should we put this the party bro vampire that's super into drugs and like being a just kind of sucking the fun out of everything you might say you know he just he just wants to have a good time and in, in uh, his immortality yeah That's also something that's... Okay, so this is a weird thing about the movie, right? That I noticed is... So, these guys have lived throughout the centuries in-universe, right? 
each one of them is at least over like two, three hundred years old, and they all still dress like they're from the sixteenth, seventeenth, or eighteenth fucking century. Yeah. And no one seems to care. I, I like how when they go to the clubs, they're just like, bro, fucking retro, man. I do think they get away with it in that these guys, all these guys kind of look exactly like Orlando Bloom from the previous decade. So, or Johnny Depp, I, frankly, in the current decade. I like, I like that. That's the, the thing. They're just like, do all, is that like a thing in New Zealand? Do all like New Zealanders look like, um, or Orlando Bloom from Pirates of the Caribbean when they go clubbing? Most with, likely. like, the lace shirts and shit. I oh, mean, how else are you well, supposed to get women, Dean? Damn it, you're right. Damn it, you're right. <sighs> but, yeah. Um, but we have all these weird characters. Then they meet Nick. Oof. Okay. Now, I guess now we can get into the fucking plot. Because <laughs> then Nick's a whole, a whole plot point. Yeah. And there's some fun gags with Nick. Yeah. Because he's a vampire, bro. I mean, I think this is kind of the the crux of the movie that maybe Spinal Tap can learn from in that the movie isn't just about vampires. Like, it's not just a documentary that follows vampires. It's about a group of vampires that lets a normal person into their group who happens to become a vampire. So there's almost like an even better deconstruction of things in that way. Um. And especially when the when the normal person is such a spaz and a dick at the same time that you know it's kind of it's you kind of even further hard to take it seriously. My favorite character, honestly, Nick's your favorite character. Yeah, just because I, I know it's like the the latter part of everything. Maybe not so much, but like I love when he first becomes a vampire because he's like. <laughs> Bro, I'm a fucking vampire, man. Yeah. Dude, I want you to know, vampire, man. Free drinks around the park. Let's go. Because I'm a vampire. Literally lines from the film, ladies and gentlemen. Now, I'm interested, so too. Uh, is this basically the premise of the show? or? What you, oh, oh, like, um, yeah. So the premise of the show, it's like the same kind of thing. It's a mockumentary or documentary crew following around this group of vampires but instead of them being in new zealand they're in staten island in new york mm. and it's um it's good i really enjoy the show it's really funny right um the first i'll say this the first like two episodes are really like weird because they're like closer to like the office than like what this movie is and, but then after that, it's just more of this movie, and it's great. It's just, no, it's just no, Chef's Kiss, great. Love that show. Also, Mark Hamill's in that move in the show for some reason. Really? he loves the show, and it's awesome. Yeah. Oh. Luke Skywalker's in there. And he, and he fights, you know, the you know the guy from Dark Marenghi's Dark Place for the deep cut for everybody who watched Adult Swim in the early to mid-2000s. Fascinating. Yes. Well, um... I'm, Come on, David. I'm left speechless. Um, I guess where we, where I'm interested because of Nick as well, right? Is that the movie? I think is a really good bet because the other thing about these two is that these are both an hour and a half, but the hour and a half I think is better balanced in this one. Mm-hmm. It, especially because it 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 felt quick, but it also felt like longer than an hour and a half, but in a good way, where I felt like I was constantly engaged. Um, that all the gags were set up in the good in good places and were quick. Then the plot points had gags that made sense for the plot points, mm-hmm. with proper deliveries that didn't fall flat for some viewers. Um, and two, that there were emotional bits in the movie. Now, I, I'm not saying that they were get your t- box of tissues out, but there were reasons other than one time in the latter half hour of the movie to actually follow the characters along. Yeah, I feel like the big point of this is the writing in this, or I guess how the film's constructed, is is a lot cleaner. It's really clean. I, where like a lot of mockumentary films aren't really um, aren't clean in how they're put together. Yeah. Sometimes they feel like we're gonna just run scenes for X number of minutes and kind of loosely figure out how they're put together later. And this is a little bit nicer. And 
also it's amazing because I looked up how they made this movie. And basically they literally just followed these characters around while they were in character and just threw together like 800 hours or 1600 hours worth of footage and Jesus, made this. Are you kidding me? I mean, no, that's probably not... a gross. Uh, yeah. I was about to say, I, I believed you for a second, but I see now that I've been. No, I swear to God. No, I it's, I'm pretty sure it was something like that. Like it was put together by like jumbling together, like hours and hours and hours worth of footage. I, I believe see. the hours okay. and hours and hours. Never mind. I am I am full of shit because it's not 800 hours. It, yeah. It's 125 hours worth of footage. That's still a lot. I'm though. full of shit. That's yeah. That's a fucking lot. That's five Cause... solid days that they had of uh, footage on the, and they had to cut that down. By the way, back into an hour and a half, which is a a good hour and a half. Don't get me wrong. It's a tight hour and a half. Yeah, that really like there's no holes in it there's no loose points i mean that's kind of incredible that they were able to dig that of 125 hours i'd be interested to see what else is supposed to be in there <laughs> um yeah, especially because i don't know what the script looks like for this right yeah and there's a lot of like choreogra- like i said before choreographed bits in this that seemed like they wouldn't be in a plan for 125 hours of film you know like there's the flying gags where they they would definitely would have had to been like suspended on something in order to accomplish that. Yeah. There's other gags that require that or other like moving parts in order to complete. There's the actual chase scenes. There's the special effects in anything they do. Like it's kind of impressive. I'm I'm honestly wondering how much like like effects footage was like hey this is gonna we know this is gonna be in the film so we're gonna actually shoot this and how much of that time was just them talking to each other like how much do you think that most of that 125 was like dialogue hours that's what they're talking to each other and improving yeah that's my immediate thought i mean i i i certainly believe that taika watiti and jermaine clement could probably carry all that you know 125 hours but like just riff off of each other for like 120 hours and then just say, eh, fuck it, we'll find a movie out of this. Yeah, it's like after a while, what, what did they get to? Just talking about Parliament? Like, what <laughs> What else is there to talk about after five solid days? Um, bro, like, we make, dude, we make a podcast. Like, what the fuck do you think? Yeah, but <laughs> we have like a whole movies. week in between. Like, these, I know they probably weren't actually, you know, it's not five solid, solid days, but how much can you talk about as a vampire before? It's like, well, I don't know. That's kind of it. Uh, why, why would I have to give my opinion, a vampire's opinion on American football, you know? Honestly, that that's kind of like a thing in the movie, right? Where these guys are immortal and all this other stuff, but they're pretty much terrible at everything. Yeah. It's like the thing. You now have infinite time to like participate in anything you want, but these guys are so mediocre at everything they try at. It's It's kind of sad at the same time. Yeah, I mean, and it's funny. I don't know. I I think it's one of those things that they probably just don't put a whole lot of time and thought into. Because after a while, you'd be like existential. Mm-hmm. It's like it's like when we go back to um, Palm Springs and and Groundhog yeah. Day. It's like that whole existential threat of like I have so much time on my hands, I may as well just get good at piano. Or I may as well learn the dance moves to something that will impress everybody in the same hour of every day for the rest of my life. I don't know. I mean, that's kind of what they're faced with. But at the same time, because it's such a silly movie, they're like, hmm, I don't know. I'm just going to have orgies. Bro, just have orgies, Yeah, I guess. Which is also a plot point in, in Palm Springs. Bro, yeah. the, the thematic, the themes, man, the themes. But yeah, so what are we do in the shadows? So this is um, kind of an interesting movie, not only just because of what it is as a movie, which is interesting because, like, you know, mockumentary about vampires, which, you know, takes that whole mockumentary thing and just goes all the way with the weird, gaggy surrealism of it. Yeah. But it's also interesting because it, I don't know if it straight up launched the career of um, Waititi. I, okay. I'm, I'm not even memeing. I cannot pronounce that man's this name. This man's made a Marvel Next. movie, Dean. 
Yes, he did. After this movie. I'm sorry. I can't I can't do it. I'm s- so my boy T T W. That's he, fair. That's you know, fair. yeah. Would you say that this is the movie that kind of launched his career as a director, at least in American films? Uh, yeah, probably one of them. Um, I almost feel like if he were to talk about his career this far, if I can pull it up real, real quick, um, this is probably one of that fans of his know. Uh, unfortunately. There are certain things in his career that have also graced the screens that, you know, he he's apparently connected to the Green Lantern film from 2011, which is. I'm I'm looking at director only. All right, I ain't looking at, at none of those like things you try and scrub from the internet. That's fair, but you know, Be- like he had a a really good career in New Zealand before he came over. Um. Hmm boy is one of his films that he i think also stars in that I th- is apparently I think very boy good. won an oscar yeah i want to say it was nominated for one yeah yeah that oh and that too he's technically his first i think it's his first I, it seems like that's what i heard in the interviews i've seen of his his first short film won an oscar and then that's why he actually decided to make movies is he was like well i guess i'm not gonna quit now um, He's like, I guess I'm actually good at this. All right. Which is like, you know, what do you do, dude? Um, but then, you know, you get you get like Thor Ragnarok, which is probably the big thing. And then obviously then recently Jojo Rabbit, which is incredible. Yeah. Well, I, th- I think then, okay, maybe what we do in the shadows isn't the thing that launches career. Because obviously this man is is committing nothing but bangers every time he hits the he hits the director's chair. But it's it's weird because I don't remember his name before this. Apparently, you don't remember right? his name now, Dean. <laughs> uh, no, okay, no, I can't pronounce his name now. Fair. All right, I remember this name. It's, it's too hard for me to pronounce to forget it. But I I wonder if it's like that's a thing where you know, like you could be well known in like New Zealand, and then like is that like a weird conflict between like a, the view of like American film people versus like world film people? Because I'll, I'll freely admit that I'm very focused on, like, American film in general. I don't really... I watch, you know, foreign films. I watch not a lot of them, but I do watch foreign films, you know, pretty regularly. Is it just the thing where this film kind of just launched him in the American market? Probably. I mean, I, I think that anybody who's keeping tabs on, like, another film's indie scene to that degree is obsessive compulsive at a a certain point like it's just like you don't need to you know you just Mm -hmm. just keep in in touch with whatever you come across that's how i would put it and you know that's kind of if we're if we're gonna get existential again for any creator it's like that's kind of how it goes is you you find a niche and that's where you exist until you find something that gets you a big break and if that's what this is great if that's something else this is probably a stepping stone to getting there. I certainly think that this is responsible for, for him to getting meetings that involved getting a Marvel movie, you know? Um, yeah, because that, that's the goal now. You just need to get onto a Marvel movie and then you're set for the rest of your career, right? Probably. I mean, you probably make enough money to literally become that vampire who lives for the rest of eternity. Um, but yeah, I, I mean, it's... I. I don't think I don't know if it's a totally American view because maybe this is also that does like a French cinema goer know everything about the New Zealand like the indie New Zealand scene, or does a Japanese film goer know everything about the uh, Italian? They might, but you know what I mean. I mean, it's like yeah. Whereas people know, does everybody know exactly what the American indies are? Probably not because well, they know all the commercially available American stuff. Who they probably don't quite know who made Nomadland or whatever the recent indie film is that is sparking up conversation. Um, yeah, it's true. So I don't but know. But I do wanted to. I I found this out right now, and I wanted to brighten your day. Mm. So you enjoy this this man's work, right? You enjoy the man T W's work. Yeah, big T W fan. This man is going to be making a TV series soon about. Time Bandits. There's going to be a Time Bandits TV show, and this man is directing it. 
Oh, I think are I've you, heard about ready this project this? actually. Which Time Bandits, we uh, if those who don't know, is one of our favorite episodes that we've ever done. Yeah, on this show, it's fantastic. I mean, yeah, I think I remember him mentioning this in in one of his interviews. But what a, I mean, I don't think there's anybody better right now on the film market to do so because he's he has exactly that kind of like parody, but kind of a little bit more highbrow style of comedy. Mm. Um, Jojo Rabbit is a prime example of that, and. Two, I think he also really masters like childlike whims- whimsy in in a lot of his stories, which ironically, you know, Jojo Rabbit is also a depressing example. Of, but um, yeah, it, that's really good. I mean, there's other things listed here too that I have here another version of Akira listed for 2021 that he's apparently attached to. Oh, bullshit! Okay, I can't say bullshit because I threw I threw time bandits at you a second ago but i i said that because like, they've been trying to make an akira movie for like 40 years yeah i don't think it's 40 years old but they've been trying to make it for 40 years so apparently this is just what i've uh, based on a quick google there's a teaser there's him listed as director and then co-screenwriter with katsuhiro Oto- otomo uh otomo yeah uh leonardo dicaprio is listed as being one of the producers i don't know this is where it starts to unravel for me and then the headline then which is kind of sad to me the akira movie is still happening but possibly without what taika watiti so you know don't don't worry about it i've i've literally seen the headlines for the akira movie is coming this summer for the last like 15 years yeah I cannot wait for us to get to the weird anime shit this year because, oh, man. Oh, man. <laughs> yeah. I don't watch a lot of foreign films, but I watch a lot of fucking anime. <laughs> I, I oh will God. say yeah, I am excited to get to Akira because I watched this um, this Pixar animator that was like kind of a lower level Pixar animator in the studio. He did like a full breakdown of the first like five minutes of the movie frame by frame. And it was the most fascinating 40 minutes of analyzing animation I've ever seen. Dude, like, people do not understand how in how fucking insane Akira was when people saw that shit in the West. No one understands. Like, this blew people's fucking minds. But that is for a later date. Mm. But us talking about these things, you know, will kind of goes with something we'll be talking about next month, right? All the foreign films, a foreign director, foreign thoughts. Yeah, we are going to do a foreign film month. Um, I'm very excited for it because we're starting things off with a real spicy note, you could say, Dean. Um, oh, God. Stop throwing those puns at me. They fucking hurt. Not quite a Damn. pun. Come on, give me some credit. We're going to be starting things off with a couple Mexican filmmakers, uh, Guillermo del Toro and Alejandro Cuarón. I think I'm pronouncing yeah. that right. Yeah, Cuarón. Uh, who are responsible for Kronos and Y Tu Mama Tambien. Y Tu Mama Tambien. Perfect. See. Si. Yes. All right. But yeah, uh, loosely translated to uh, Your Mother Also. Hmm. There you go. But yeah, also, if for all of those people out there who have seen these movies, yeah, we get it. They're not actually related other than the fact that they're in Spanish. Yeah. But. I think what we tried to do for a lot of these, these are, I think, both of these directors' first movies. Uh, I know that's the one for Cuaron and then Cronos. I'm I, pretty sure Cronos is his first, yeah. is Del Toro's first. Um, and then, you know, subsequent movies throughout the month are kind of different pairings of different types of things but i i think we got some really really great heavy hitter pairings going on this month and i'm excited to dig into it with these two to start as am i because uh as we said we don't really watch a lot of foreign films on the regular right david yeah i know i don't do it super regularly you the same i watched movies exclusively in different languages that i don't understand ah but of course yeah. but of course kind of makes it yeah. hard 
just a hair, just a little bit. But I think that'll be a fun, fun month coming up as we close out um, our month of comedies, which I will say we saw a lot of good ones. I don't think we saw a, any total shit shows this month. We may have saw a shit sandwich, though, but that is uh, something that will be discussed later. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah. But yeah, so there we go. Next week is Kronos and Yutumama Tambien. Fascinating. Yeah. And if you are going to watch uh, these movies and you have children, do not watch them with children. <laughs> All maybe right? Kronos. Maybe. Maybe. There's a child in Maybe. It, but, you know. Yeah. Uh, Mama Tambien? No. You do not don't watch this with your kids. It is not it, no. That is an that is a double that is an X movie, homie. That is an X rated movie. You live a little. Yeah. All right. So next week, Mr. David. Yeah, I mean until then, Dean, where can all these new foreign listeners that we're gonna be racking up with all these foreign episodes, uh, where can they find us to keep up with everything? I guess the best place they could find us is our YouTube channel, In The Frame, on YouTube, where we post this podcast and our other podcasts and more podcasts to come. And other than that, you can find us on our social our, uh, social media uh, sites, which are currently our double feature underscore podcast on Instagram. And I believe we'll be setting up a new Instagram relatively soon due to some complications with the tech side of our stuff. Yeah, so and keep an keep an eye out for it. It's coming, and uh, we, we should have an update in the new month, maybe to uh, entice you to follow us on even more places on Instagram. Yes, I do. We try our best. We try our best. Yes. Uh, other than that, you can find us on Anchor.fm sponsor the episode and where we host all these podcasts and you can too we get our podcasts on spotify google podcasts all these other great places where you can find us and listen to our not so radio dj ready voices um and i think that's it I think so. yeah i think that's all we got this week kind of a light one but you know rip the band-aid off and it's over well, I didn't know that your time was so well enjoyed. Bro, I waited five hours for you to show up. Uh, what you mean, fool? Uh, but yeah. All right, everybody. See y'all next week. See everybody next week. Peace. See you.